I don't need to start this presentation by telling you how much of a challenge this pandemic has been. We have all been living it every day. The scientific community has risen to the challenge at a speed that is breathtaking. This chart shows the growing size of the literature. We're now at well over 25,000 papers, letters, and preprints. The number's growing daily. But this chart tells us a lot of stories of fast turnaround times, of doctors, of researchers who have spent their lives studying similar viruses and have now turned their attention to this one. And also of labs and of scientists who have completely retooled and refocused to rise to this challenge. This chart tells us about a mass mobilization, but there's also a catch a growing information glut that is hard to make sense of. Life and death decisions weigh on the question, which papers do you pay attention to? Which do you trust? I work for an AI company called Primer. We use natural language processing and machine learning to structure large unstructured document sets and to summarize them to help make sense of them for people. When the outbreak started, we refocused our efforts and we built this public free website in order to give people another way to explore this growing literature. We shared it with scientists, with researchers, with policymakers. And I hope that after this talk, you'll have an opportunity to go and explore it too. And I hope that you'll find it useful. Now I'm gonna spend a very short amount of time talking about how we built it, and then a longer period talking about the lessons that we've taken from building it. We started by collecting the literature. Firstly, we went to PubMed, which is a large collection of published, peer-reviewed papers and letters. Now, these are from all kinds of different journals. We also went to the three preprint servers, BioArchive, MedArchive, and Archive. And we supplemented these with a stream of news and Twitter data, linking them up when they mentioned the papers by URL. We set up a process to get this every day, and we feed it through a pipeline of natural language processing doing things like extracting people's names, extracting quotations, um, attributing them, resolving them, summarizing. And that's what gave us this site. Now, there's a number of different ways to explore the site, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I am going to show you a couple of my favorites. So firstly, we have a dashboard that gives you a view of the most recent changes. So what's new? We then have a fully automated natural language briefing. So this is generated without human intervention every single day. And it gives you highlights of recent papers that were widely shared and discussed. And my favorite feature on this is that we're able to find quotations by paper authors when they appeared in the news talking about those papers and show them alongside. We use classification to bucket the papers into major research categories. And we use an unsupervised topic modeling to discover emerging areas of new research. So what did we learn from this? Well, this is going to be a tale of three parts, of confusion, of conspiracy, and finally, thankfully, of hope. Science is not a tidy process. It leaps forwards in fits and bounces, and especially in a pandemic, when the available data grows rapidly, as ideas are challenged, our best interpretation keeps on changing. This is a well-known researcher walking back his earlier findings on how the virus made its way to Seattle. After taking more samples, after doing more research, what they realized was there was another path that perhaps made more sense through British Columbia. 
This is how science is meant to work. But it does make it very hard to keep track of, to know the current status of each idea, and to weigh the uncertainty of what we know now. And that's especially difficult for policymakers who have to make decisions now. But this is happening at a time when the scientific process is changing. Preprints are new to the biomedical literature. So these are documents that are not peer reviewed before publication. And instead that review from other scientists happens in the public eye after they are shared. Now this means that the research can be shared much more quickly and a much wider set of eyes can look at them. And this is really, really good news in a pandemic where you want, um, where time is of the essence. But it does make it very hard to know what to trust. So we've had preprints around for a long time in the mathematics and physics world. Archivers have been around for decades. But MedArchive, so in the medical space in particular, it's very, very new. MedArchive was only launched last summer. We're still figuring out the APIs. We haven't had time yet to figure out how to talk about these publicly. But they are a large proportion of the research. So 25% of the content on our site is from these preprints servers. And a third of the news talks about them. So they are very much in the public conversation but this is also happening at a time when journalism is under du duress as a result of the pandemic and of longer term changes and challenges. 40% of journalists in the US were laid off this year, 40%. That's a staggering number. And it means that there are far less people in newsrooms able to take the time to help us make sense of what is going on. And what does that mean? Well, here's a paper that was published in early May. In it, the researchers looked at samples of the virus that they took from different patients and they compared them. They compared the genetic sequences. And what they found was that there were differences. There were mutations between them. And that some of those mutations, some of the versions were much more prevalent than others. So what do we take away from that? Well, the first interpretation, the first interpretation is that this means that there is a newer, scarier version of the virus that is wildly transmissible. And maybe it means that things are different. We should be concerned. On the other hand, there is much more nuanced reporting that explains that possibly what we're seeing is just the result of chance some versions just happen to be the ones that spread further. So our interpretation affects how nuanced we think the science is and how much more there is to learn. But there are also less benign processes at play here. One of our findings has been that the most widely shared papers on Twitter are the most controversial not the most useful. This paper, which was posted at the end of January, was at the top of that leaderboard until about the middle of May. In it, the researchers compared the genetic sequence of the coronavirus with the genetic sequence of HIV. And what they found was that snippets of the genome, um, the coronavirus genome, look the same as snippets of HIV. This they called uncanny, it begged the question, how did they get in there? Well, as soon as this paper was released, the scientific response was immediate and very harsh. Here's one example. An assistant professor of biochemistry from Stanford University, she said, the similarity is spurious, not higher than chance. As a result of this and of the overwhelming feedback, the authors withdrew it. This was celebrated as a great moment for science. And this is how it's meant to happen. Anyone can upload their research to the preprint servers. The scientific review happens. And if the science is found to be faulty, 
the paper can be withdrawn and then we can all move on. Apart from if we don't all move on. We found that of the 42,000 tweets about this paper, 20% of them happened after the paper was withdrawn. And even now, if you search for this paper, what you find are tweets like this one, asking whether the withdrawal is actually evidence of suppression. These tweets feed into a wider conspiracy theory. How do we have these conversations about uncertainty where our view updates when there are people willing to jump on it and interpret it this way. So where do we find hope? Well, it helps to go back to this incredible chart. Science is marching on. We know so much more about the virus now than we did when this started. We know how it affects our bodies. We know how it's transmitted. And we have many more ideas about how to treat it. Science is a fantastic process for finding knowledge, even though it is confusing. It's a fantastic process because it works. But that doesn't help us answer the question of who do we trust? How do we make sense of this as we see it unfolding before our eyes? Well, the first good thing to look for are the people helping uh, explain it to us. So great journalism is able to engage with the nuance and the uncertainty. This article from Ed Young at The Atlantic does that very well. There's no clear evidence and there probably won't be for months. This is the article about that confusing mutation study that I showed you earlier. He's written a fantastic series of articles that explains some of the uncertainty that we have to live with as we walk through this pandemic. There were also a large number of scientists who are taking a lot of time to explain and contextualize the research that we're seeing. In the site, if you go and look for the people who are most quoted, if you click on the numbers, you can read some of their recent quotes. One of my favorites here is Caitlin Rivers. She's able to bring her background in public health to explain what the path out of lockdown might look like. Here she is describing how Liberia handled the Ebola epidemic. And she's hopeful about what we can achieve now. So here it is. We should take time to explore and engage with this literature. And we should do so as optimists, skeptical ones, skeptical optimists, engaging with this growing content and realizing that it's uncertain, but looking for the places where emerging scientific consensus is growing, where papers build upon each other, where the evidence is mounting. So what lessons can we take away from this more broadly, and especially for our work as data teams? Well, firstly, it's very good for us to reflect on the fact that this is the era that we live in, one in which information is abundant and easy to access, but one where we don't know why we are shared, the content that we are shared. Why do we see what we see? We don't know how it fits into a bigger picture. You and I could spend all day reading true things, and at the end of the day, not have read any of the same things in common with each other and have a completely different view of what's important. That gulf between us is an enormous problem. It's one of the defining challenges of this era. But I do see some reasons for hope. We have a toolkit in front of us where we can do things like structure text, aggregate it, compare it, summarize it. We can do that at scale. Recent advances in natural language processing allow us to do it with much more precision than ever before. Recent advances in the infrastructure allow it 
allow us to do it with a much greater ease than we've been able to do it before. And those to me seem like some of the building blocks that we need to be able to build tools that really support people's quest for knowledge and for truth. And especially for people whose job it is to make sense of all of this for us, whose time is tight and incredibly valuable. I think we have a real responsibility in this moment to see what we can do to bring to bear these technologies to make better sense of it. Thank you.